Good day to you lovely people. How are you this day? Welcome to the other news you're never going to hear on TV. So top off the news for today is the great resignation in America. This is staggering, folks, and I don't think this is a uh, going to point to anything good in our near future, especially with inflation and no taxes are being paid in. Uh, 34 million people have quit in the year 2021 alone. That's what all the mainstream media is telling everybody. What they are not telling everybody is that many of these 34 million people in America have been relieved of their job duties because of the poke in the shoulder mandates. So many of the articles I've been reading on this just make it look like Americans want to live off of the government, get um, free money, and have lowered their expectations on how much they rake in a month. And I don't believe that's actually true. So there is this uh, feed going through the media the mainstream jokia that Americans are just downright lazy and don't want to work anymore. In September 2021 alone, a record 4.4 million Americans were either forced to resign for their jobs or they quit outright. So there is so much going on and so many loaded factors into these articles that I want to be very careful how I tread here because not only did 4.4 million Americans quit their jobs in September, but that same month, companies made 6.5 million new hires, um, which suggests that mass resignations are mostly driven by chance. That is a laugh and a half. So a lot of these dissociated workers being fired because of the mandates for the poke in the shoulder, uh, they're being given no other choice but to go other places. And now, regrettably, some of these hospitals and who have gotten rid of complete nursing staff and several doctors and um, things like that, they're begging for these people to come back now because they can't handle all of the sick people coming in from Omicron. <laughs> It's just insanity. So instead, they're chalking up all of these reverberated garbage pieces of article out there, basically stating that instead the true case or cause is the hesitation of workers to return to the labor force due to the influences tied to the pandemic, such as infection risks, infection-related illnesses, and the lack of affordable child care. Now, this is the new spin they are trying to push on all of the dumbed-down people in the world, folks. Time to wake up. Small businesses were decimated during the lockdowns, the majority of the lockdowns. And guess who got all that money? Yep, you know it. Amazon and all these big companies that could afford to ride these lockdowns, they stood to make hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars during this time. Some other articles I read in just one day alone in New York City, one hospital fired over a thousand nurses at one time. I mean, if you're having this happen in one section of the city and you times that by however many cities are in America, I mean, that's where these numbers are really coming in at. 4.4 million people leaving their jobs, quitting? No. I would say that at least 80% of them are being forced out of their jobs because of the poke in the shoulder mandates by, let's go Brandon. Oh, and isn't it convenient now that this news article came out yesterday on Tuesday that now Mr. Biden doesn't want to accept any blame for all of this now coming to fruitation. His his fruit is being born now in America. So now he says, after running on the promises to, de to defeat CV, pretend, 
President Biden now says there is no federal solution to this crisis and tells the states to now they've got to fix it. Pretend Biden stressed that the current surge in Omicron cases nationwide could only be combated with the poke in the shoulder and press the governors to continue lobbying their respective populations to get VA seed and booed. Look, there is no federal solution, he says. This gets solved at the state level and then ultimately gets down to where the rubber meets the road and that's where the patient is in need of help or preventing the need for help. Nothing like passing the buck when everything starts turning sour and backwards on you. All right, getting on to the wars and rumors of wars. Iran has fired 16 surface-to-surface -surface ballistic missiles in what Tehran said was a warning to its arch enemy Israel. The move by Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps on December 24th marks the end of Tehran's military drills in the Gulf. The five-day annual exercise, dubbed Great Prophet, began on December 20th. Tehran has said that the military drills were intended to send a warning to Israel. And heading towards the Gog from the land of Magog in Ezekiel 38 and 39, there will be no more NATO expansion, declares Russia. At upcoming talks with Washington, Moscow will not only obstruct, but will put a complete stop to any eastward expansion of the U.S.-led NATO military bloc, the Russian deputy foreign minister said on Tuesday. Sergei Ryabkov said his country would go into the negotiations with a clear agenda and reject any attempts by U.S. diplomats to dilute the proposed agreement between the two parties. He stated, Our leadership has repeatedly said we can no longer tolerate the situation that is developing in the immediate vicinity of our borders. We cannot tolerate NATO expansion. We will not just prevent it. We will put a stop to it. These talks are due to be held on January 10th, which will focus on two publicly released, released draft treaties that include a list of promises Russia wants to obtain from the U.S. and NATO, as well as pledges that the bloc won't expand eastward. The proposal also includes the end of Western cooperation with post-Soviet countries, the removal of U.S. nuclear weapons from Europe, and the withdrawal of NATO troops and missiles away from the Russian border. It's getting heating up there, folks. World War III is on the horizon. And China has tooted their little horn, responding to Russians' pushback against the Western's attempt to dominate the world. China agrees with Russia that the West's desire for dominant position of the world stage is unacceptable, and the two countries must work together for a mutual development, Beijing said on Tuesday. Foreign Minister Spokesman Zhao Lijian was speaking at a briefing following a claim on Monday from Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov that the West, quote-unquote, does not want to have any rivals of comparable influence in the international arena. We support Mr. Lavrov's words, Zhao said, on Tuesday, as China intends to work with Russia to help intensify cooperations between all countries and create new incentives for universal peaceful development. He also stated, I want to stress that China-Russia comprehensive partnership relations in the new era are as strong as a rock. At the same time, cooperation between our countries is not aimed at defeating anyone, he said. The PRC always pursues an independent policy, contributes to maintaining world peace, actively contributes to global development, and ensures the preservation of international order, which means war at some point, correct? In economic news, the IMF, World Bank, and 10 countries held an alarming simulation of a global financial system collapse. 
earlier this month, it was reported at Reuters that they seem to hid from most of American public eyes and ears, probably even the world. Its content would be sure to alarm most people concerned with the outbreak of yet more global catastrophes, quote-unquote global. At the very least, it's curious timing amid recent pandemic-induced disruptions in the global supply chains. Powerful nations and banking institutions decided to get together to run a global economic collapse scenario. The report described that Israel led this 10-country simulation of a major cyber attack on the quote-unquote global financial system in an attempt to increase cooperation that could help to minimize any potential damage to financial markets and banks. It was centered on a catastrophic scenario in which hackers were 10 steps ahead of us, according to one official who took part, it was dubbed the collective strength. The exercise was held in Jerusalem um, and included the participation of U.S., U.K., U.A.E., Austria, Switzerland, Germany, Italy, Netherlands, and also Thailand. Officials from the IMF, World Bank, and Bank of International Settlements was also involved. So the financial geopolitical gaming simulation was set amid a scenario where sensitive data was leaked onto the dark web, which combined with fake news reports going viral across societies, resulting in the collapse of global markets and an ensuing run on banks. Further, the simulation envisioned a series of devastating hacks targeting foreign exchange systems which also disrupted transactions between importers and exporters. The simulation set out a severe crisis period lasting a week and a half. Events were guided by a film and narrator which related the fast-moving live events. According to Reuters, these events were creating havoc in the financial markets, and it further detailed the simulation of the Israel's finance ministry, the banks are appealing for emergency liquidity, liquidity, excuse me, assistance in a multitude of currencies to put a halt to the chaos as counterparties withdraw their funds and limit access to liquidity, leaving the banks in disarray and ruin. The participants discussed multilateral policies to respond to this crisis, according to to a coordinated bank holiday, debt repayment grace periods, swap repo agreements, and coordinated delinking from major currencies. So what was the successful 10-day part of this exercise was aimed towards each country being prepared to contain the national damage coming from some of the major cyber events. The key takeaway was that only through Catch this through rapid national international cooperation and open communications among all nations would there be opportunity to prevent this total collapse of this economic society, the financial system, and so on. It is very much doubted that the Western public will feel comforted by these global quote unquote elites engage in a simulated meltdown, international meltdown readiness scenario. And the fear goes on and on and on. And just to show you that the fear just continues to be Orwellian and just psychopathic in nature, Austria's deep tyrannical government has expanded as people are now being hired to hunt down the unvac the refusers so this is really happening according to the publi published article by blick um, the city of Linz, which is home to 200,000 inhabitants has a relatively low vac rate of 63 percent in response Linz now wants to hire people who are supposed to hunt down these vac refusers 
The role of these inspectors will be to check on whether those who do not get VA seed really pay for it. So some of these fines um, are pretty darn hefty. Austrians who refuse the VAC by February 2022 will be fined up to 7,200 euros or $8,000 for non-compliance. And those who refuse, you get to go to the jail. In another strange news story, I thought this was interesting because this is really going to expand the technocracy and the transhumanist movement. This is coming out of Barbados. The first diplomatic embassy has now, it's being ready to be opened in the metaverse. Barbados, population of 287,000, opens its next embassy. Almost anyone on the earth will be able to knock at that door. The diplomatic compound is being built in Decentraland, an online world or metaverse accessible through a computer and virtual reality headset. So this is really setting up for the auto mall. I don't know if most people realize what this is, but basically it's a plot of virtual real estate in Decentraland recently was sold for 2.43 million gucci christian du jour and ralph lauren are selling virtual clothing in 3d worlds the crypto asset management firm grayscale estimates the metaverse is a trillion dollar revenue opportunity obviously all americans recognize this auto mall as a grouping of the big car dealers in the same complex. Now imagine a virtual embassy row in the metaverse where your avatar can visit to conduct official business with embassy avatars from your favorite nation. Barbados is claiming the first spot, but don't expect sandy beaches and warm waters. So for these next several articles, I want to refresh all of our memories about what Werner von Braun told Carol Rosen on his deathbed as he lay dying of cancer that there's a strategy being used to educate the public and decision makers being used to scare tactics that is how they are to identify the enemy so Werner von Braun taught Carol Rosen that the first would be the Russians. They are going to be considered the enemy. And in fact, in 1974, they were the enemy, the identified enemy. We were told that they had killer satellites. We were told that they were coming to get us and control us, that they were commies. The terrorists would be identified next. And that was very soon after that. We heard a lot about terrorism. Then we were going to identify the third world country crazies. Saddam Hussein, Gaddafi, Mubarak. You know it. We now call them nations of concern. But he said that would be the third enemy against whom we would build space-based weapons. This next enemy is going to be asteroids. Now at this point he kind of chuckled the first time he said it. Asteroids against asteroids. We are going to build space-based weapons. And then finally, over and over during the four years that she knew him and was giving speeches for her, him, she would say, he always told me to bring up the last card. And remember, Carol, that last card is the alien card. We are going to have to build space-based weapons against aliens and all of it is a lie. So here we go with some whopper of some news articles. Why is NASA hiring religious leaders to prepare for encounters with aliens? This is coming out of prophecynewswatch.com. In a rather bizarre move, NASA has recruited a British priest to prepare the religious for the discovery of alien life as space agencies claim to be getting closer to discovering evidence that life exists outside of quote-unquote planet Earth. If 
Folks, most of you know by now, I'm a flat earther. I believe that God created the earth on four pillars. It's all in the Bible if you choose to believe him. Reverend Dr. Andrew Davidson, a priest and theology professor at the University of Cambridge, is among 24 theologians who are participating in a program sponsored by NASA at the Space Agency Center for Theological Inquiry, CTI, at Princeton University. The theologians are attempting to assess how major religions would react to news of alien life being found. The appointment comes as NASA's $10 billion James Webb Space Telescope blasted into space on Christmas Day. The vessel will implement cutting-edge technology to examine every phase of cosmic history inside the solar system. Quote, unquote. Anyway, this device features infrared capabilities, will study a wide array of scientific questions that will help mankind better understands the origin of the universe and humans place in it folks we're already been given our holy bibles we just got to read it to know where we belong so davidson seeks to answer the theological questions such as whether or not god made life in other parts of the universe and if he sent a savior to die for those sins of those aliens Another question the British priests seek to tackle is if discovering extraterrestrial life, catch this guys and gals, will require religions to rewrite the entire story of creation in Genesis. Oh boy, they hate Yahweh so much. They just can't wait to start all of this right now. Some of their other questions are how will this information impact ideas about creation and about God himself? This NASA NASA sponsored program, never a straight answer, at the CTI is described as building bridges of understanding by convening theologians, scientists, scholars, and policymakers to think together and inform public thinking on quote-unquote global concerns. Now, what did we just talk about with Werner von Braun? It was to educate and to inform the masses and policymakers. Okay, so here we go. The last card is being played, folks. How close are we to the return of Yeshua HaMashiach? And I've got to say it. I've got to say it. I have believed for years now. I don't think I've ever publicly said it that often. But I have believed for years now that they're going to actually view Christ's return as an alien invasion. And that's why the whole world will be gathered together once they're fighting in Megiddo against each other. They're all going to turn their forces against Christ when he comes, when Yeshua comes in the clouds with his saints. So folks, get ready. I mean, the world is going to start ramping up right now. We've got a lot on our plates And we've got a Bible to get into so we can have some peace of mind and peace in our hearts. A book you may want to look out for. um, I'm not suggesting you buy it, but, you know, if you want to know what's in it, I guess you got to. So uh, Davidson and one of 24 religious members who had taken part of this project wrote a book called Astrobiology and the Christian Doctrine, and it's due to be published in 2022. So that might be something you would be interested in looking out for. And just another thing to throw in there, during Revelation chapter 12, when Michael and his angels fight against Satan and his angels and kick the dragon out of heaven permanently forever and ever, there will be no more place for him to go. So they're going to use, I believe, this whole entrance, this being kicked out of heaven, to their advantage of saying, yes, we have now come in peace and we want to bring all kinds of knowledge to humanity and we want to take care of you and and set you straight, blah, blah, blah. Oh yeah, they're going to play this up big time. And it should be very eye-opening too as well that a Catholic priest is leading all of this. Um, Come on, guys, the Vatican, yeah. So let's talk for a brief moment about um, 
a Hebrew prophetic view on the year 2022. It's so close, a couple days away. And many of us are scratching our heads wondering what is coming next. And so although we know the major parts that are coming, the minor parts also lead up to this. There is a really significant number called 22. That is, <laughs> oh, me and 22 go far, far back. Anyway, hopefully you will read about it in my new upcoming book, which I'm trying to finalize right now. Uh, since I have extra time on my hand, I'd figure I'd get that out of the way. It's probably going to be about, I don't know, 70 pages. We'll see what happens at the end of it. Anyway, hopefully you'll sign up for that. While we can't read too much into numerology, the number 22 associated with this year is a very significant prophetic number and it carries many layers of biblical meanings. So depending on who you get your numerology information from and how you view numbers in scriptures, uh, especially from E.W. Bullinger, which they... By the way, pulled off of the internet. So if you'd like a copy of that, please email me at Yahweh's Words Only at protonmail.com and I can shoot you a PDF copy of it because I did save it if you can't find it. So according to Numbers and Scriptures by E.W. Bullinger, he says the number 22 being the double of 11 has the significance of that number in an intensified form, disorganization and disintegration, especially in connection with the word of God. For the number two is associated with the second person of the Godhead, the living word. And yes, for you non-Jewish believers who are listening to this, don't get angry because, you know, if you just go back into your own words, Yahweh the Father has a vice regent. I mean, you can find it all the way through scripture, especially in Isaiah. Yahweh's name is even in him. So anyway, continuing on, it is associated with the worst of Israel's kings, Jeroboam in 1 Kings 14 and 20, and Ahab in 1 Kings 16 and 29, each reigning 22 years. 11, we have seen, derives its significance by being an addition to divine order, number 10, and a subtraction from divine rule, number 12. These are two of the three ways in which the written word of God can be corrupted. The third being alteration. Woo, don't you get God bumps right now? I'm just like getting God bumps. The words of the Lord are pure words, words pertaining to this world and therefore required requiring to be purified, but these words have been altered, taken from, and added to by man. Is there anything in this which connects it with the fact that the letters of the alphabet, the Hebrew alphabet, are 22 in number? Does it point to the fact that the revelation of God in being committed to human language and to man's keeping would thereby be subject to disintegration and corruption. Whew. All right, now let's get to from this article from prophecynewswatch.com. And I believe it was written by P.S. Enoch Lavender, wherein he says that 22 is the number of completion and fullness being that the Hebrew alphabet consists of 22 letters from the first letter Aleph to the final letter Tav, the Hebrew Bible features many acrostic passages, which are passages using all 22 letters of the alphabet in sequence, which each successive letter starting a new line. From the Hebraic mindset, passages that use the entire Hebrew alphabet in this way speak of perfection, fullness, and completion. So here's some acrostic passages in the Bible, Proverbs 31, 10 through 31, which is the perfect woman, and Psalms 112, which is the perfect man, Yeshua HaMashiach. Psalms 119, the perfection of God's law. Each letter is used to make eight successive lines. There is also a correlation between the number 22 and the themes of chaos and judgment in the Bible. For example, three of Israel's wicked kings, as I mentioned, 
earlier, Jeroboam, Ahab, and King Ammon reigned for 22. Uh, Jeroboam and Ahab ruled for 22 years, and King Ammon began his reign at age 22. Sadly, these wicked rulers of both Israel and Judah led the people away from the ways of God. God's resulting judgment on Jerusalem is graphically portrayed in the book of Lamentations. This book is written with four acrostic chapters as it is describing the perfect and complete devastation of the city. A closer glance at these acrostic chapters reveals a startling find. The sequence of the 22 letters in these chapters are partially jumbled. For Hebrew readers, this jumbling of letters would be painfully obvious, as it would be for us if we got our ABCs mixed up. This jumbling of letters just a clerical mistake, or does it carry a deeper meaning? Rabbis affirm that this must have been a deliberate choice by the author to symbolize the jumbling of God's divine order caused by sin, leading to both chaos and judgment. The destruction of Jerusalem featured in the Book of Lamentations is further linked to 22 through association annual feast days on the Jewish calendar. The two most prominent fast days are the 17th of Tammuz and the 9th of Av, which marks the beginning, the breaching of the walls of Jerusalem. The end of sacrifices in the temple, as well as the destruction of the temple itself by the Babylonians as well as the Romans, on the very same days, some 600 years apart. The 22 days between these two significant fast days are to this day an annual period of national mourning on the Jewish calendar. The minor prophet Zechariah refers to the fasting days marking the destruction of Jerusalem and promises that they will ultimately turn to joy and gladness, Zechariah 8 and 19. Since the destruction of the temple by the Babylonians, many other disasters have happened to the Jewish people on these very same days, which has intensified the mourning period. Yet the prophets declare that a day is coming when Israel will be comforted not only of the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, but also of all the other calamities that have happened to them. And when this happens, the 22 days of mourning will truly turn to joy. So 22 is being linked to joy and restoration. It's also found in the story of Joseph and his brothers. And we see, remember the story of Joseph's agonizing betrayal by his brothers, his years of slavery, his unjust imprisonment, and how God raised him up to be second only to Pharaoh. And it took 22 years before Joseph's brothers finally stood before him and teary-eyed Joseph could finally reveal his true identity and embrace his brothers in repentance. For now they knew all of the dreams that Joseph was having did in fact come true. Many scholars see the story of Joseph as prophetic of Jesus' separation from his Jewish brothers. Like Joseph, Yeshua has been thought of as dead by his people, and like Joseph, he is now a foreign name, Yeshua and Jesus instead of Yeshua. As Joseph wore foreign clothes and spoke a foreign language, so Yeshua has been dressed in foreign rituals and religious traditions that conceal his true Jewish identity. Yet one day, he will be restored to his long-lost brethren, and this restoration is linked to the end times and the number 22. The Jewish calendar instituted by Yahweh himself in Leviticus chapter 23 features three autumn feasts. Interestingly enough, I never even thought about this. The fall feasts take place annually over the course of 22 days. It gives a panoramic, prophetic preview of end times events. The Feast of Trumpets, which is repentance at the sounding of the great trumpet. The Day of Atonement, restoration with Israel, crying out to God as a nation. And Feast of Tabernacles, rejoicing as God finally dwells among his people again. In the, this context, it seems like no accident that the Bible is most detailed book of end time prophecy the book of revelation has catch it 
22 chapters. You know this. Come on, people. So in this article, it really talks about the number 22 linked to both chaos and destruction, as E.W. Bullinger pointed out. But Bullinger didn't get to the port of hope and restoration because maybe he wasn't aware of all the sequence of events that the end times prophecy was going to be revealed. And obviously, back in the early 1900s, 1800s, whenever he lived at that time, um, all this stuff was still new to everybody. And, and only during these last end of days have knowledge been increased. So we've gotten a lot more information on what is probably going to be happening. So even though we know these major end time events are on the horizon, they are literally coming towards the threshold of the door right now. And but we've been through years of chaos and disorder now caused by the nations of this world and the evil people in high, dark, wicked places uh, trying to tyrannize all of humanity. And these challenging times have rocked many of our lives. It's separated families from each other, not only through death, but of fighting and just total disagreement of how to live life and you know, whether this be financially, emotionally, physically, or even spiritually, it has also rocked the very foundations of our societies with great divisions, economic upheavals, and so much unrest in many nations. So keep in mind in the midst of this chaos, let us remember that Yahweh is a God of restoration and order. He loves to heal. The message of number 22 shows us that God can and will turn sorrow and chaos into order and joy as we turn back to him and his ways, not the ways of Christianity or any other religion. Turn back to God's word. Learn from the Holy Spirit. Let us take hope for this year ahead and believe God for better things to come in 2022. With that said, I'm going <laughs> to leave you with two articles you can find for yourself in um, the description box below. It was quite stunning, actually, when I found out what was going on. U.S. Congressman Representative Paul Gosar, a Republican of Arizona, has always been outspoken advocate for Israel, but recently he's gone over the top and is criticizing the recent UN resolution concerning Jerusalem and the Temple Mount. In his response, Gosar called on the UN to dismantle the Muslim structure in Jerusalem, all the structures in Jerusalem that were built on the ruins of the Jewish temple. Woo, things are getting heated up, folks. And here's the last article. The temple vessels are ready for the rebuilding of Jerusalem's third temple, and it is prophetic. It has to come to pass before Yeshua HaMashiach comes back. So, What's very interesting about this article at the MessianicBible.com in the description box below. Some years ago, a group of Jewish visitors to the Temple Mount reported seeing ancient beams dated to the first and second temple period being used as firewood by the Arab community. So that was a very interesting article that you should definitely come back and read. All right, with that said... I want to let you all go. I'm still kind of grieving off and on for the loss of my employer and friend. Um, folks, when you're a caregiver and you're with somebody for so long, you're, they're not just your employer or just some patient. They're, they become your family. You get to know them very intimately and, you know, talk about your past history of your family and where they came from and all this kind of stuff, you know, and it just melds two people together, you know, and if there's a spouse in there, it melds all three of you together and kind of weaves you into their family. So it was a huge loss and I'll make a, a pretty potent statement here from what I can think of after through my grieving process for over a week and a half now. I really, really thought about it over and over and over again, and from the symptoms that he was having and from the absolute rapid decline that he took place. Okay, so put this into perspective. In February of 2021, he had a stress test, which, you know, 
measures how well your bad your heart is doing. And he came back perfect. He was awesome. March 2021, got the poke and shoulder. Was doing okay up until about July, August. And then started, he was actually getting up, starting to walk. He was, you know, his breathing was getting better. I mean, slowly, he was still smoking, but it was, his body was getting better. And we were in physical therapy. That was all getting better. And then all of a sudden come August and September, he started to decline and started to sleep all the time. Um... He ended up developing these little purple red splotches, these little circles all over his feet and under the arches, even under under his toes and stuff. And uh, we had a nurse that visited and said it was percussus or something like that. And so we ended up going to the dermatologist and he didn't know what it was. And he said, it probably is this percussus, whatever. And so he gave him this clobetazole, which is a super potent corticosteroid and it worked. So it wasn't until last week when I was doing research through tears, um, trying to figure out what was going on with his body and how he declined so rapidly was... Um, a few articles coming up from India and other nations and a couple coming up from the UK and in America was saying that this was a symptom of the poke in the shoulder, that what's going on is the spike protein goes through your cardiovascular system and your veins and your arteries and it's just carving them up. And so the blood and the dead cells have nowhere else to go, but it goes to the lowest extremity of your feet and they start forming these little dots of blood in the capillaries. And so I was thinking to myself, my God, these were symptoms and nobody even talks about this stuff and nobody's like sharing this information out there. And it's really hard to find stuff on Google these days. And so I was kind of really distraught about it. And what ended up happening is come October, November, you know, he was just in rapid decline. His breathing was getting worse. And then in December, those first two weeks of December, it was just awful. I mean, he couldn't get enough oxygen on him. I had to call the paramedics. He was on 25 liters at one point. It was just unbelievable. And, you know, there's this thing called oxygen toxicity where you're getting too much oxygen in your blood and the carbon dioxide can't get pushed out of your blood. And so it's a real... It's a real bummer on stress on the system, especially the heart. And so ultimately, when he was presented at the emergency room, he was uh, presented, passed away, and they said it was more likely that it was his heart uh, just couldn't pump the oxygen into the body anymore. And so his heart gave out. So that's probably what they labeled it as. But I'm going to tell you right here and right now, after what I've seen, what I've seen, was that this was poking the shoulder related. So I'm going to leave it there, folks. Thank you all, especially to you, Joe T. You know who you are. I still haven't you know, put that piece of paper in its proper place, so to speak. And so it's been raining and freezing rain here, and I don't have studded tires. So I just, I haven't even checked the mail in almost a week and a half, two weeks now. So, but thank you, Joe very, very much. I appreciate you. Um, thank you all for coming. I love you all very dearly and keep looking up. Yeshua HaMashiach is coming back. Maranatha, everyone.